Morning, everyone. How are we doing? Okay, fine. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair enough. I'll remove that. That was only just to see if you were see if you were paying attention. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to morning worship as we gather online. How exciting! I hope you are all well. And uh, thankfully, the hour changing hasn't seemed to caught many of us out, which is exciting. I saw Tom Bull first on there this morning. Very, very good. Um, now, quick question. Who likes the shirt? I'm going to wait for the comments. Yeah? No? Now, this is a shirt uh, based on John 21, when Jesus has the miraculous catch of fish. And can anyone remember the number of fish that he that are caught? 153. Guess how many fish are on this? Oh, no, I don't know really. I just like the shirt. Um, if you are a regular member of Holy Trinity, it's nice to have you this morning. If you are a guest and or a visitor, uh, you're so welcome. We're so glad that you've joined us uh, online this morning because uh, we are church gathered across uh, various parts of Staley Bridge and Tameside meeting in our homes, but we're still very much the church. And it's great to meet this morning. Please do you uh, use the comment section on the right. And I'm going to be checking that uh, and as we interact with one another uh, this morning as we worship Jesus. Uh, you're absolutely right, Adele. There is still no tie. I'm really, really sorry about that. Uh, but also do let us know if there are good news stories that you want to share with us, because God is still very much at work even though we are not meeting together face to face. You can send good news stories to goodnews at hts.church uh, or send in a, a good joke because actually at this time, at this season, it's good also uh, to, to laugh together as well. So as we begin worship, let's pray together. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world. Grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, as we gather, very often what I do in the morning is ask the Lord what he wants to do with us as we gather. Uh, and I like to ask others as well, because no one person has a monopoly on what the Holy Spirit says. So one of the team said this morning, the Lord wants to remind us that we are loved and to stand firm in that love. What a wonderful reminder as we begin our worship that in Christ, we are loved far more than we can ever know or imagine. And it's important that we remember that because it's a very strange time at the moment. These uncertain times can be rather unsettling. And it is a bit of a season where your emotions can be all over the place. And the truth of God's word and the truth of God's promises really help to anchor our soul. Psalm 46 this week that I was looking at says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know. He is God, that we have, he has got this. Uh, when I arrived at Holy Trinity, I've only been vicar since September uh, 2018. Uh, the first sermon series that we did looked at one Peter. And uh, it was very much a letter that the Lord had put on my heart. And I felt the Holy Spirit prompt me of this. So I reread the letter this morning. And this was the very first sermon that I preached. And based on these verses, it says this in verse one, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience in Christ and the sprinkling of his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. I felt God this morning remind me that this is us right now, that in the midst of uncertainty, we are still his chosen people. We are still his. And that just doesn't change. So let me read it to you like this for us this morning. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, 
to God's elect strangers in the world, scattered throughout Staley Bridge, Ashton, Mossley, Mottram, and the rest of Tameside, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. So as we've said, this is a challenging time, but it's also an opportunity to get closer to Jesus. We've held our 24 hours of prayer from Friday, five o'clock till Saturday at five o'clock, which is a wonderful time to be in God's presence, to hear what he's saying to us as a church. Some people prayed alone. Some people prayed with others through social media. And I do pray that in this season, you will draw close to the Lord as he draws near to you. Our small groups do continue, and many met this week online through Zoom. Uh, I have to confess, until recently, I'd never even heard of what Zoom was. Now it seems to be on my lips in every other sentence. If you would like to join a small group, if that would be helpful for you at this time, please do let us know, info at hts.church. But I do wish to pause at the beginning of our worship just to thank all of the church family at Holy Trinity, for how we're supporting and blessing one another. I know many are ringing and texting and WhatsApping, if that's a word, and keeping in touch with those who may be socially isolating alone. This is why we are family, that we are in this together. So if you do need anything, please do get in touch with us and we will respond as best as we can. So just before we have our notices and we pray again, I just want to... Uh, bring one thing to your attention. There's a wonderful artist called, a Christian artist called Charlie Mackesy, and he uh, on Twitter posted this. I'll put that right up there, if you can see it. And he said to it, one day we will be able to hug each other again and pop round for a cup of tea. We will look back with grief and pain but also what brought us back together and reminded us what really matters. One day we will be free, but different, kinder and better. I found that really powerful this morning and a wonderful reminder that this isn't forever and that God is with us. So let's pray and remind ourselves of that this morning. Father, being alone is hard because we are created for community and not confinement. But we're so grateful that no matter how alone we may feel, you never leave us or forsake us. And we're grateful for technology that helps us to stay in touch with each other. Today, please remind us that this time of social distancing and isolation will not last forever. Give us the strength to endure this difficult season and deepen our connection with you and your people. Empower us with an extra dose of your love, peace, hope, and joy, because we need it. Remind us of your promises, and please heal our land. Amen. Amen. So we are in a very difficult difficult and different season as church, but it's also good to remind ourselves that there's, there's a, an, an opportunity to invite those who are not part of our community, our church family, to join us. It's never been uh, easier to invite someone to church because actually they don't even need to leave their house. They don't even need to get dressed. They don't even need to brush their teeth. They just need to log on. So perhaps in the coming weeks, we might be thinking about who we can invite to join us to be part of the community here. Let's share the love of Jesus and the gospel with those who need it most. So uh, just one or two notices. Uh, the first one is, can you please make sure that uh, all your information is up to date, that we have the most uh, accurate uh, and up to date information? Because we are hoping to contact people by email. So if you have that, that's great. If not, um, of course, we'll be uh, ringing around as well. But email and Facebook group are probably the easiest ways to communicate out to everyone. Uh, you should, if you have young children, have received one of these via email from B. It is to do with the family after our worship this morning. Uh, and it's a fantastic worksheet, really, that's all about how we can uh, watch the Bible story that we're going to look at today, 
how we can pray together, how we can respond as a family and learn a memory verse. So if that's something that actually it would be really helpful for you as a family, while there's no kickstart or gems, do take one of those. Again, it's been emailed and it's on the Facebook group. Uh, it's really, really good. So thank you so much for that, B. Uh, and one final thing to say is last Sunday at seven o'clock, uh, many of us lit a candle and prayed uh, with the churches around the nation. Well, the Diocese of Chester are asking that we would do that again uh, this week at seven o'clock. Uh, and they've given, <laughs> sorry, Adele, Adele has just told me, is this the screen or am I receiving that badly? That really made me laugh. That's so that's so rude. That's one of our church wardens. Um, this 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 evening, if we could pray, uh, they've they've suggested taking one hand and praying for our church community with our thumb, the NHS with our first finger, the government with our middle finger, uh, those in care homes and most vulnerable with our ring finger and our little finger, praying for individuals that we know ourselves, and then taking our other hand. Reading Colossians 3 at 12, we are to put on compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And when we pray together and clasp our hands, let the clothing of one hand touch the people and the places of the other and see what God will do. So a wonderful reminder to pray if you can tonight at seven o'clock, even if it's just for two minutes for 20 minutes, however the Spirit leads you. There's more details on uh, the diocese website. Great. Okay, Adele's now confessed that that was Chris on her computer. So uh, that's Crispin Truman who has done that. You know, my former administrator has uh, cracked that joke. Uh, well, um, we're going to uh, sing this morning. I, I, we're learning with uh, with technology uh, how we can stream and, and do things a, a little bit better. So do forgive us if the sound isn't isn't great this morning. We're working on that. But I thought we would sing an action song because I think that's one of the things that makes us church. And we're going to sing Our God is a Great Big God. And it goes, Our God is a great big God and he holds us in his hand. He's higher than a skyscraper. He's deeper than a deep blue sea. No, than a submarine. He's wider than the universe and beyond my wildest dreams. He knows me. He loves me since before the world began. How marvelous to be a part of God's amazing plan. Yes, Alistair Ben, we are doing action songs. So we're going to sing this one together and we'll see how we get on. God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hand. He's higher than a skyscraper. He's deeper than a submarine. He's wider than the universe, beyond my wildest dreams. And He's known me, and He's loved me. Since before the world began, how wonderful to be a part of God's amazing plan. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hand. He's higher than a skyscraper. Deeper than a submarine, it's wider than the universe, beyond my wildest dreams. And he's known me, and he's loved me, since before the world began. How marvelous to be a part of God's amazing plan. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, our God is a great big God, and he holds us in his hand, and he holds us in his hand, and he holds us in his hand. Amen. Judging by all of those um, 
responses on there. That was very, very encouraging that some of you uh, wanted Rue rather than me, that some of you wanted to find the mute button. Uh, so thank you so much for all that encouragement. Great. Um, our joke of the day has been sent to me by someone who is very, very funny. And let's see if you can do better than this one. Okay. What ended in 1944? 1945. No, I've got that wrong. What ended in 19... <laughs> I just completely messed that up. This is why you can't do it live. Uh, you cannot do it live. Send me a joke that's got to be better than how I've done that one. Okay, some good news stories. Um, there's loads of these this morning. Loads of these, which is very, very exciting. Uh, I have set myself a target this year of reading uh, 50 books. I'm on book 14, which is really, really exciting. And I'm... Um, I'm reading this one. If you want another book to read over Lent, this is absolutely fantastic. On the Road with St. Augustine, uh, which is a, a deep thing about spirituality. Do take uh, one of these uh, away. Do order one of those. That would be great. Um, technology. Uh, many people have said the good news is technology, that we can actually still meet together. And uh, Jackie's reminded us that this week, Technology has allowed her to hold a meeting, have a music group practice and catch up in her discipleship group all from home. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, Sue Smith has said thank you so much uh, for the woman who comes to her prayer breakfast and took the time on her walk to bring her a wonderful, encouraging card delivered and written with protective gloves on. Uh, but it was the first person that she'd seen face to face in seven days. Now, it's just a reminder, isn't it, that actually this isolation causes us to, to be apart. So celebrating those things are absolutely fantastic. The good news, many people have said it, it's been a great time to, to get to know different members of the church family. Luke Shepherd. OK, I'm going to try again with a joke. What ended in 1944? 1943. That was it. That's what I was meant to say. Thank you so much, Luke. It just shows you you need a few takes for this thing. Um. Really exciting. Chris and Heather O'Connor are expecting baby number two. We are so thrilled for you. And that is so exciting. I'm going to pray in, in a moment. But I'm just going to let the comments on the right hand side catch up with that, that the O'Connors are expecting uh, baby number two. If you're struggling for a name, Gary is a good name. So I just leave that with you. Um. Other good news is uh, Sophie and Martin have gotten engaged. Um, when Sophie got in touch, she said, you know, Martin, he's the one with the ginger beard. And then put a laughing emoji next to it. Now, Sophie, please, ginger beards are uh, no laughing matter. But uh, no, congratulations to you both. Uh, and just an, one final bit of good news. Sarah and Cumbers, uh, as many of you have followed uh, through our Facebook group, have been in hospital and, and out again, and they've been in again, just checking that the baby is okay. Everything is fine. Baby's heartbeat uh, and baby is healthy. That's all great. And they are going in tomorrow uh, for a C-section uh, and for the baby to be delivered. So please do pray for them uh, tomorrow. And why don't we pray for all of these things now? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the good things in our lives. For Jesus, for friends, for family, for technology helping us to connect. For getting to know new people and for getting to know those we don't know much better. Father, we pray for the O'Connors. Holy Spirit, would you protect them and would you fill them with your presence? Would they know Jesus in a really powerful and real way today? And Lord, we pray for Martin and Sophie. And Lord, I pray for them to build their whole relationship and marriage on Jesus. Thank you that you call us as Christians to seek you first. So help them both to do that. And as a result, grow closer to you and to each other. And Lord, we thank you for Sarah and for Cumbers. And tomorrow we pray for a supernatural peace to accompany them. We pray for protection. We pray you guard them with your angels. And we pray for wisdom and discernment for all the medical professionals who are helping them. Pray for a safe delivery of the baby in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we look at God's word this morning, and uh, we're continuing in our series uh, based on John Mark Comer's work, um, 
Chris Gascoigne is going to speak to us in, in a, a moment. Uh, but before we, we do that, let's say a prayer of confession, because as we worship, it's good to remind ourselves that uh, we are not perfect, but we worship a perfect God who loves us and who will forgive us if we are honest with him and with ourselves. So God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. So I'm going to say this prayer. Do join in if you can remember it. If not, just say amen with me at the end. But let's just close our eyes, focus on God and ask the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. So I'm going to tag Chris Gascoigne in, uh, who is going to speak to us. And for that to happen, <laughs> okay, I'm going to read this joke out before because um, I've just literally got a joke sent to me. Um, I might read that later, Trevor, but thank you for that email. Um, Chris Gascon is going to speak to us now. What we need to do for this is to leave the live stream, uh, which I'm going to end in a moment, and click on the video that's been uploaded on our YouTube page. And then in about 30 minutes, so around 20 past 11, we'll meet back here to pray and worship uh, and close our time of worship. So the talk is around 20, 22 minutes. So you've got half an hour, plenty of time uh, to um, make a brew and plenty of time to watch that. Um, Chris, this is brilliant. You see how interactive this is. So Chris Gascoigne has just said reading. So I'll read it then, Chris. I'll assume that that's, that's not there on, on the video. So the reading is Matthew 6 beginning to read at verse 25, and it says this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They, don't, they do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what shall we eat or drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we're going to pause. We're going to end the stream and I'll come back uh, in half an hour to start again. You've got that time then to watch Chris's talk. So see you shortly. Good morning to everyone who's joining us online. Uh, we trust that the Holy Spirit will help us as we look at this teaching together. Um, I was recently looking through the church vision statement um, here. and. It has something to say about what we're doing at the moment as a church. There's a part in the vision statement that says that we are committing to Bible teaching that centers on transformation as well as information. Centering on transformation as well as information. God is in the act of transforming us. And the classical people who look at spiritual disciplines or spiritual habits say there's really three ways that God does that. First of all, there is the power of the eternal Holy Spirit. 
which is there for all who believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Secondly, and crucial, I think, at this time, but at all times, is circumstances. How we respond to circumstances, how we listen to God and live through those circumstances is a fundamental part of our transformation. So as we live through this virus at the moment, let us understand that God is still with us. And this is actually a part of our transformation and our growing. The third thing which is very important is holy habits or what the classics call the spiritual disciplines of life, the habits of Jesus. And that's really where we're looking at at the moment as a church. So Adele recently took us through the habit of entering into silence. Peter spoke about the power of rest and observing Sabbath. And last week, Gary urged us and encouraged us to simplify our lives. And today we're going to look at the habit of slowing. What can we do as disciples of Jesus, despite living next to a four lane motorway of life? We are in the hectic rush of life. A life dominated by social media, notification every three seconds, serial text messages, blogs, chats, and binge viewing, binge, binge viewing of line of duty. And that was all true when I was asked to deliver this sermon. And I guess a lot of us felt like we really wanted to get away from that sort of uh, world. But recently we have now entered into another world, a world of social distancing, isolation. And I certainly feel I've got a bit more time on my hands. I don't know about you. But whilst the hurry might have been reduced, it will come back again. And my thought is this. What better time now to learn some of those habits of Jesus before the pace of life picks up again? In the Old Testament, um, the Israelite nation was forced into exile in Babylon. It became a time and a period of national reflection. It forced them to ask themselves key and crucial questions about their lives and their relationship with God. And perhaps our own exile at this time can serve in a similar way. And we can learn more about what it means to be an apprentice of Jesus Christ. So talking about apprenticeships, let me introduce you to my grandfather, Sylvester Kelly of Sandal Street, Miles Platting, Manchester, who was a cooper by trade and he made wooden beer barrels. He served a five year apprenticeship working under a qualified cooper. And for five years, he saw his mentor shaping, steaming and bending the wood. He saw him fire the steel rims that held the barrel together. But eventually there came a day when Sylvester could produce a pristine beer tight barrel all on his own. Capable of holding 288 pints of Wilson's best bitter. He had served his apprenticeship. When Jesus said, follow me, he is calling us to an apprenticeship. He's inviting us to adapt our lifestyles to the one that he fashioned. And one of the habits that he displayed was slowness. And by slowness, I don't mean a static or a lazy life. Nobody would ever accuse Jesus of that. But I do mean a life that takes time to be oriented towards precise goals. A life that knows what is important. A life that knows what to leave in and crucially what to leave out. You see, if we are to be purposeful in our discipleship, I am persuaded we have to be precise. There is a danger of trying to do too many things, trying to be too many things. And God calls us to be precise in our living. So what can we say about the pace of life? I want to just tell you a story about the day the milk race came through Ashton. I did tell you this story five years ago, so forgive uh, me if you've heard this one before. But if you're as old as me, you've forgotten it already. So the milk race came through Ashton and it was raining, of course. We were informed that the race would come through at 10.43. That was, in fact, a lie because at 11.15, there was no sign of a cyclist, at least not a cyclist who was going to get to the finish in Chester by midday. And through the crowd, we heard a whisper that the riders were coming through Mosley and they'd be with us in two minutes. I was now wet and I was cynical. 
So I did a quick, quick calculation based on the two minutes and the 4.2 miles between Ashton and Mosley, and then waited in eager expectation to see someone traveling 126 miles per hour on a push bike. Finally, after waiting about five minutes, more lies, the leading group came into view. And after five seconds, they were out of view. I started to feel quite bitter, but still, there was the joy of the peloton to come. 60 riders bunched together, their eyes firmly fixed on the riders in front of them. Something they had been doing, by the way, for the last 40 miles. Within 23 seconds, the peloton had also passed by. Half an hour of waiting or more had been rewarded with 28 seconds of seeing a blur of coloured jerseys. It was then that the body of spectators entered into a collective mystery. Silence fell as we tried to soak in, literally, what had just happened. Then almost as one, the entire crowd looked back down the road towards the Albion Church, as if to wish into being a further supply of cyclists. We felt that our waiting had not been rewarding. We wanted to see more cyclists, and we were hoping that Albion Church somehow was going to produce this issue of cyclists. Then it slowly dawned on us, and a brave man near me uttered the words that were on all our lips. Was that it? Was that it? Sadly, we knew the answer that after more than a half an hour in the best rain that Ashton could offer, we were resigned to the fact that that was it. This soaking experience serves for me as a metaphor of life. First of all, there is the frantic peddling of the cyclists. I'm quite sure that if I interviewed one of the guys in the peloton after the race and asked him what he thought about Ashton, he'd probably say number 53, the number that was in front on the rider who was in front of him. The flowers in the park and the architectural wonder of the parish church would have been lost on him. Is there a danger that we pedal furiously through life without understanding what it's all about? And secondly, there is the utterance made after the cyclists had passed. Was that it? Could it be that my parting testimony after my allotted time on planet Earth is was that it? One of the problems of a frantic lifestyle is that it almost always leads to us being reactive. We react to the latest prompt or the latest information, and information can only sometimes be five seconds old. Life feels out of control because we are subtly allowing others to control us. Many management and self help books are written on the tyranny of the urgent. And they remind us that the urgent is not necessarily important. And I am persuaded that if we do not control the day, the day will control us. A consequence of forever being in reactive mode is that we seldom complete our goals. We have our aspirations, but somehow life stops us getting through them. I love the words of Roger Waters of Pink Floyd fame because he speaks to this he talks about plans that either come to naught or half a page of scribble lines hanging on in quiet desperation is the english way the time is gone the song is over i thought i had something more to say another consequence of a frantic reactive lifestyle is that we become disintegrated people our personalities lack integration and wholeness. Richard Foster, a master of the spiritual disciplines, notes that we stop being a single person and we become a whole committee of people, each with its own agenda, but held in the same mind. We start to disintegrate. So we have a family self, a golf club self, a work self, a down the pub self, a political self, and scarily, a church self. Each self is making demands on us, pulling our soul in different directions. As I considered these ideas while on my regular rendezvous on the M60 at Simister Island, a question popped into my head. 
A serious question, I believe. Is our world toxic towards knowing God? You see, for us, the Christian creed is awesome and spellbinding and the most magnificent thing I know of. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We also know that the curtain in the temple has been torn. We can have access to God. God is present amongst us. And the Holy Spirit has been poured, poured out on all people who believe. He is our ever present friend and counsellor. And yet I ask myself, in my life, does my experience bear the weight of my creed? And I ask myself this also, could it be that the incessant frenzy and the noise of our surroundings and the noise and clutter of our hearts is actually suffocating the ever present voice of God in our lives? Our reading today speaks of the desperate attempts to hold life together. Don't worry, says Jesus, knowing full well that that's what we're going to do. And he picks on two essentials of life, food and clothing, and he tells us not to worry about them. He's not saying there are no problems. In fact, in verse 34, he tells us, don't worry about tomorrow because today's got enough trouble of its own. But he is saying that worry isn't the solution. And neither do I believe what I call a sticking plaster approach of trying to hold a disintegrated life together is a solution either. We need a more solid solution. So what then is the advice that Jesus offers? It might seem strange, but his solution is not to address our needs. His solution is to address our focus. He points out that if we try to hold life together in our own strength, we are behaving exactly the way as a pagan would. He says this in verse 32, for the pagans run after these things. The pagans are trying to hold life together. Now, the use of the term pagan here is not derogatory. It's simply referring to someone who does not have faith in God. And because they lack a knowledge of God as their loving father, then it's hardly surprising that they feel the need to hold life together themselves. In fact, Jesus is declaring the pagan as sensible. Because after all, if nobody is looking out for you, why not take responsibility yourself? I think there's a contemporary illustration. How do we explain hoarding since the announcement of coronavirus? I think there's many explanations. But it could it be that desperate attempt to hold our lives together. Somehow we feel we have got to fix it ourselves. And even if fixing it ourselves might create shortages for others. But for people of faith, for people who trust in a creating, providing and recreating God, I think our obsession with our own cause is not logical. And it seems to me that Jesus has offered us a choice of two kingdoms, both of which we as Christians believe are real. Either the kingdom of rush and hurry or the kingdom of God. Because Jesus says this, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. I want us to notice the change of focus here. Moving the focus from ourselves and holding life together ourselves and moving to a single focus on his kingdom. Now, I don't have time to give a full exposition of the kingdom of God, so I'm going to try and cover it with the minimum of word count. But you can find it in the Sermon on the Mount, which starts in Matthew 5. And if you're short of something to do today, your homework is to read the Sermon on the Mount. But when we speak of the kingdom of God, we are recognizing an invisible yet real kingdom which operates in the spiritual realm. It is a life, it is a kingdom where our lives are dominated by the Holy Spirit. Good question to ask though, what does this kingdom look like on Monday morning? Well, it looks like the Sermon on the Mount and it defines the upside down rules of how the kingdom operates. A place where the downtrodden inherit that kingdom, where those who mourn are comforted, 
where the meek inherit the earth, where the pure in heart are those who see God, where enemies are loved, and where greatness is displayed by being the servant of all. So how do you and I as Christians move towards this kingdom focus? How do we practically seek first his kingdom? I explained briefly earlier, I believe that the kingdom of God is open wide to everyone, but we can't see it sometimes because we live in a toxic environment of rush, hurry, noise and worry. A bit like Jacob, we're saying, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. God is here, but the noise and the hurry and the rush are deafening his voice. So what habits can you and I take to slow down? Mark Homer in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, suggests a number of simple habits which encourage that slowing. And I do recommend you read it and perhaps pick up some of those habits. A lot of his ideas are about small changes, and that I think is great. We need sometimes small changes. That is how we grow. That is how we develop through the small changes. But I want to actually offer something a bit more substantial. Three habits that I have practiced often badly, but I'm learning. And this is an invitation to all of us to learn. We can learn together. I do these. I don't say I do them well. I don't say I do them badly. I just do them. So the first one I want to suggest is journaling. For many years, I've kept a journal, which I seldom reread, and no doubt the content is probably not too inspiring. So why do I do it? Well, for me, writing is a place of consolidating my ideas. I don't seem to be able to think without a pen in my hand because I struggle to structure my thoughts. And when we write, we write much more slowly than we think. And I find that journaling forces me to be precise. You might want to give it a try. There are no rules to this. There is no such thing as a bad journal. Treat it almost like a child would have a blank page and a number of crayons. You're free to do whatever you want. But I find it's a great discipline for helping me to consolidate ideas and to hear God speaking to me. The second area you might want to consider is reflective techniques. They're all the rage now. Put it in on Google, you'll find plenty of hints and helps to how to do reflection. And I was reluctantly forced into it, but now I am a convert to the habit. In reflection, we can look at ideas, issues or scripture from usual and unusual directions. We can imagine ourselves in the shoes of a Jew under Roman occupation. What does that feel like? Or we can perhaps imagine that we are a Canaanite facing an invading Israelite army and we get a totally different spin on a very familiar story. Or we can move forward in time and look at the world through the eyes of a Syrian refugee, seeking a new life, escaping the bombs. Or we can look at what it is to be a black American during the times of segregation. You see, reflection allows us to examine events and ideas from all perspectives. We get a 360 degree view. And for me, it safeguards me against making that hasty judgment. The judgment that is not thought through and not seeing every angle. It helps us to enter into the world of others. And crucially, it slows us down. And my third thing is this, I try it, I don't always succeed, but we're learning. And it's to seize the day, be intentional about the day. You see, if we're not careful, the day can hit us in the face. Whilst we are still half asleep, within five minutes of my iPhone alarm rudely awakening me, I learn that some people cannot pronounce Sachin Tendulkar. The Manchester United defense has more holes than a Dutch cheese. And the Hang Seng has lost 23.56% of its value overnight. And then out of the tribulation of just waking up and hearing that sort of news, we are then supposed to focus 
the day on the kingdom of God. We need to start intentionally. We need to think through the day, pray through the day. You see, if we're not intentional about the day, the day will dominate us. There is plenty of material to help us to start the day with a focus on his kingdom. And the idea of the morning watch has been a Christian tradition down the ages, and it follows the pattern of Jesus. Mark says this very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So there's three ideas. and. I do just encourage you to experiment with them. Don't look for perfection. You're not going to get it. We are all learning. But I find them very useful disciplines or habits that have helped me in my spiritual life. So how do we conclude? John Mark Comer tells that the kingdom is slow. The kingdom of God is slow because it is the kingdom of love. And he challenges. He says, have you ever tried to show love to someone? when you're traveling at 98 miles an hour in the pace of modern life. It's not possible. Love requires time and the pace of love is slow. The pace of the kingdom of God is slow. I started with a picture of a frantic bicycle race. I want to close with something a bit slower. Something very slow, but something that is incredibly effective. Our geography teachers told us that the valleys of the Lake District were sculpted by glaciers. There's no fuss. There's no big deal with a glacier. They slowly and persistently move over the land. And whilst doing so, they gouge out billions of tons of rocks and they shape their environment forever. As followers of Jesus, we have an aspiration to transform our lives and to transform the town where we live in every spiritual and social dimension. We want to transform the culture. If not forever, we want to transform it significantly. There is a lot to be said for, so, for slow. Great. Well, um we're going to respond to Chris's word um, by uh, praying together. And um, there's a lot in that. And I think one of the most um, powerful things to remember is that we slow because we love. And, uh, and, and the love of God is what separates uh, Christianity from everything in the world is that we are loved more than we can possibly imagine. And that is shown through Jesus Christ. So, uh, during the 24 hours of prayer, one uh, one person had a, a vision, a picture from the Lord of a tidal wave in the sense of God pouring out his love upon us. And uh, if you're watching this morning and you're not um, a follower of Jesus and you'd like to be, um, it's very, very simple. You just turn to God, um, turn away from uh, your, your past, your mistakes, turn to God, receive his love. Uh, and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, at the beginning of Mark's gospel, uh, James Hopkins reminded me this morning, it's very simple, repent, believe, and follow. And uh, and that's a call on all of us uh, each day to turn away from those things in our lives that are not for us or good for us, and to turn to Jesus. So we repent, we believe, and we follow. Um, I've asked Clive, who was down to lead our prayers this morning uh, on our, our rota, to actually send over the intercessions, which I thought we would use for our prayers uh, before we sing. Um, so we're going to do that in, in a moment. But also, uh, the, a few in the team had a few um, words for us this morning, uh, one of which uh, is maybe the Lord wants to release healing this morning. So if you have woken up, today and even getting out of bed coming downstairs you've noticed that there are things that you're struggling with maybe your knees your back your elbow uh, i'm just going to pray that god would heal so the team have had a word uh, that god wants to do that so i'm going to just pray for that as we move into our time of prayer father god thank you so much that you speak to all of us and you're always speaking and Lord, uh, for those this morning in our community who may be watching right now or watching this back, we want to pray 
if they have woken up with any joint issues, especially knees, back, or elbow, we ask for healing in the name of Jesus. Come Holy Spirit and bring full kingdom restoration, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, as we think about slowing today, we're going to just uh, slow right now and say uh, uh, these prayers together. As I said, Clive has written them for us. So let's be still uh, and pray mm -hmm. because uh, we're, we're good Anglicans. You may wish to respond uh, when I say Lord in your mercy to say hear our prayer. So let's pray together. Lord, we come to you this morning in a new way. We come to you as a scattered church, just like the first congregations in Acts. We are out in the community. We are separated from each other. And yet at the same time, a lot of us are more connected. Please let our confidence in you, our faith and our hope cast out any fear we may feel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for your world, for this time of trial and tribulation, for this time of hope, for this time of grace. Please fill the leaders of the world with a sense of your love for your creation. For we are only stewards of it for a short time, but we are all your creation. You know each one of us. Please pour down upon our leaders, change hearts and strengthen them for the times ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we ask for opportunities to reach our neighbours at this time. Help us to have God conversations with those that are around us and like the yeast in the flour. Help us as your scattered body be the yeast that permeates through our communities. May we be your hands and feet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, help us to not wait to be told what you are already doing and what we are free to do. Help us to step out in faith and live to our potential in Christ. We can bring light to a dark world. So please help us in this world where there is need for Christ to shine through us. Help us to step out of the boat and walk where God is calling us to work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for all on the front line in this current battle. Please fill each of them, the NHS, all care, police, fire, and those who have to work to keep us healthy and whole. Let each of them feel your love around them as they undertake your work that you have called them to do. Let their sacrifices be for your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we bring to you those who are fearful at the moment. Please, would you give them a peace that passes understanding? Bring us to that point where fear is not an option. We do pray for all those who are sick in the church family at the moment. Ask for your healing to come. Fill them with your love and restore them to full health. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, there is so much happening in the world that's causing fear. Please give all of us that peace that passes understanding. Reign in our lives. We are the family of God called to serve in many ways. Each of us can act upon the calling you give us. Give us strength for the days ahead. But more than anything, give us peace and your love as followers wherever we are. Merciful Father, we accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, lots to think about um, today. Uh, the small group notes that uh, are usually sent out will, will go out to the small group leaders, but also uh, we'll make those available on our Facebook group uh, and send out via email if anyone would like to do that individually as a study as well please do. Uh, but the John Mark Homer book that Chris mentioned is a great one to practice some of these habits of Jesus. Very often we talk about spiritual disciplines, which can sound like quite a heavy, um, heavy load to bear, really. It sounds quite, you know, um, but actually a habit that Jesus did sounds far more doable. You know, do the things that Jesus did, walk like he did, live like he did. So let's practice slowing down. Let's practice that while we are able to do that. Before we say our final prayer together, we're going to sing um, 10,000 Reasons, Bless the Lord. Again, forgive us if the sound quality isn't 100% as we uh, work on this, uh, but hopefully you'll know the words. 
if if not uh, just enjoy uh, my tones as as we uh, worship the lord together oh sorry yeah i'll take that book now down sorry so there's Fowler shankley and i'll put the stephen gerard one up next week let's uh, let's sing bless the lord oh my soul <clears throat> Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before. Let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Your rich in love and You're slow to anger. Your name is great, and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to cry. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is fading, the end draws near. And my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I will worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. Yes, I'll worship your holy name. Yes, Lord, we choose to worship you this day and always. Amen. So, may the God of peace give you renewed hope and wisdom. May you find the strength you already carry within you to be enough. And may the grace of God be sufficient. May you draw a deep breath when the air around you is thin. And may you grow in compassion in these days. May you love well, not in spite of these anxious times, but because of them. Amen. 
So Richard Sunday has said he has the bad back. So uh, actually, Church, if, why don't you stretch out a hand and we'll all pray uh, for Richard right now. Holy Spirit, please, would you fall on Richard? Would you restore his back? Pain be gone in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, why don't we say the words of the grace together if we know them? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Now, last week, uh, Gavin Merrifield suggested that we uh, grab a coffee and head over to the Facebook group uh, to continue chatting. Uh, why don't we do that this week? And if that works, we'll think about a way that might spread out for those who don't have uh, Facebook going forward. So maybe see you in the Facebook group uh, in the next few minutes. So may the Lord bless you. May his love remain with you. And may God's blessing and love pour from you this day and always to those you know, love, pray for and care for this day and always. Amen. Let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord of Lords, in the name of Christ. Amen.